Hey everybody, welcome to our video on heat flow and plate tectonics. So you probably know that Earth is divided into 12 huge tectonic plates that move laterally along the surface of the spherical Earth. Imagine how much energy this takes. Huge blocks of rocks grinding against each other, generating earthquakes and volcanoes. So where does this energy come from? What actually drives this system to persist over millions and millions of years? The answer is that that energy comes from heat flow out of Earth's interior. Essentially, heat is building up inside Earth, and it's transferred up to the surface by a process called convection. And those tectonic plates, although they seem big to us, they're basically just a skin a thin, rigid skin that's being carried along the surface of Earth by these very powerful convection currents uh, in the interior of Earth. So let's take a quick look to visualize what some of these currents might look like. This is a great experiment in which we've got a hot mug of hot water here and some food coloring in a liquid. Watch as this hot liquid rises above the hot mug so it's being heated by this mug down below and sending up these plumes of hot material. In this analogy, this would actually be rock in the center of Earth's surface rising upward from the top of the outer core up towards the base of the lithosphere. As that hot rock hits the base of the lithosphere, it tends to pond up and it actually moves out laterally and it's actually that lateral motion that's going to move the plates and then watch as some of this cold material eventually starts to sink back down and f get drawn back in towards the base or the, the warmer area. So that is essentially an example of what we would call a convection cell. Now keep in mind that's happening all the time in the interior of Earth. So in this video we're going to look at a couple of things. Where does the heat energy to drive this process come from? And we're going to look at two things. The residual heat of formation from when Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago, and also the effect of ongoing radiogenic heating. And then the second part of the video, we're going to look at how does that heat energy actually escape from Earth? And there's really two main processes, uh, convection and conduction which combine to control the heat flow from Earth's interior. So thinking about the residual heat of formation, that's actually heat inside of Earth that's left over from the decay of radioactive elements over 4.6 billion years ago. And essentially what happened is that right after the earliest Earth was formed, there was so many short-lived radioactive elements that were decaying with a lot of energy. And as they did so, Earth accumulated heat and couldn't get rid of it fast enough. So eventually, it essentially melted down. It crossed the melting temperature of iron, which became liquid and migrated towards the core, which is why we now have an iron core of Earth. What was left behind was the mantle a residue of silica and oxygen, iron, magnesium, that is now the rock peridotite, this mantle rock. So essentially, Earth had a nuclear meltdown around 4.6 billion years ago, and some of the heat associated with that meltdown is still trapped within Earth and is slowly trying to escape, and as it does so, is fueling plate tectonic. Now, Although a lot of the early radioactivity did decay away, we still have some important long-lived isotopes that are still adding a lot of heat into Earth's interior, namely uranium and potassium. And this diagram is, is a little bit complicated with a lot of detail. All you really need to know is this. The continental crust is essentially loaded with a large amount of potassium and a large amount of uranium has 10 to hundreds to thousands of times more uranium and potassium than the mantle does. So per mass, the continental crust 
generates a lot of heat, essentially because it's very radioactive. However, the mantle is so large that even though it has lower concentrations of uranium and potassium, it actually generates more heat energy overall than the continental crust. But the really in the, the key takeaway from this is that essentially ongoing radioactivity in Earth's interior produces radiogenic heat, which is another big contributing factor to, to powering plate tectonics. Earth is essentially its own nuclear reactor that is powering the motion of plates on its surface. All right, so now that you know about where Earth's heat energy is coming from, residual heat and ongoing radiogenic heating, let's look at how that energy escapes Earth and drives plate tectonics along the way. So we'll first look at the process of convection. And that's one of three ways that thermal energy can be transferred. Conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction essentially occurs when heat is transmitted through a solid material by molecular vibrations. So the example here would be a hot handle on a pot. That nothing in that handle is flowing, the heat is just being transmitted by molecular vibrations along a conduction gradient into the handle. Convection is when hotter or colder material physically flows or moves, bringing hot material from one place to another. So this, in this example, that's happening within this pot. Hot water from the base is rising and cold water is sinking, just like we saw in that initial video. So that physical flowing or movement of hot material is called convection. And then finally, there's radiation, which we won't talk about much in this video. So as I mentioned, Earth releases heat by both conduction and convection. And those take place in very different parts of Earth. Uh, in particular, convection only occurs or mostly occurs in Earth's mantle, uh, where peridotite rock actually flows slowly over time. As I just said, warm rock upwells and cold rock sinks down. However, capping Earth's mantle is the lithosphere. Because the lithosphere is so cold, the rock is essentially rigid. And that rigid rock acts as a blanket that basically insulates uh, Earth's interior. And because it can't flow and we can't move hot rocks towards the surface, that heat needs to pass by con conduction. So we conduct heat from the base of the lithosphere up to the surface of Earth. Okay, So convection happens in the mantle and conduction happens across the lithosphere. Now returning to the key point of this video, the process of convection is what actually drives plate tectonics. And here's how that's linked in a very simple way. This is much more complex in, in practice, but this is kind of the simplified version. And that is uh, hot. A lot of the, the heat of Earth is coming from the interior still, so it's hotter down here. And as hot mantle rock begins to get hotter and hotter, uh, it starts to upwell towards the surface because it's more hot and buoyant. And essentially, it comes up towards the surface and it actually drives seafloor spreading. That hot rock triggers melting at the mid-ocean ridge and makes magmas and allows us to, to create new oceanic crust at mid-ocean ridges. Now, on the other end of a convection cell, for example, at a subduction zone, colder, denser, older oceanic lithosphere is effectively sinking back into the mantle. That old oceanic lithosphere has had a lot of time to cool and thicken and become very dense. And so it's now gravitationally unstable and it actually spontaneously sinks back into the mantle. And effectively, that sinking lithosphere acts as an anchor that drags down O younger oceanic lithosphere that's coming behind it. So we can kind of get these anchors that pull lithosphere, especially oceanic lithosphere, down back into the mantle. So what we essentially have then is sources of buoyant upwelling and then sources of 
of negative buoyant lead downwelling. And those are kind of driving convection. And the rigid lithospheric plates on the surface essentially are kind of following along. They're accommodating this upwelling and this sinking, kind of as if they were part of a conveyor belt getting accommodating the upwelling and downwelling. So again, these plate tectonic plates are essentially a rigid skin that is being kind of pulled along as, as the uppermost manifestation of these convection cells. But of course to us, that's a big deal. There's a lot of force and a lot of energy as these plates collide against each other. All right, so let's wind down this video by looking at conduction, which is the other major way that heat energy escapes from Earth. So conduction is quite inefficient, um, especially in Earth. As I've mentioned before, solid rock is a great insulator. You can think of this like an oven door. Right? The inside of your oven is at 400 degrees Celsius. The outside is cool to the touch. Okay, So like the lithosphere, your oven door is a very good insulator. And what that means is that it can maintain a high thermal gradient across the lithosphere. Essentially, at the base of the lithosphere, you could have temperatures of uh, 1300 degrees C, um, which would be rising to or cooling to zero degrees C at the top of the lithosphere. And that's exactly what this diagram shows. It shows depth down into Earth. Here's 500 kilometers depth. And it's a graph of depth versus temperature along the top, OK? So we're at zero degrees C at the surface. And we warm up to about 1,300 degrees C at the base of the lithosphere. And basically, that is a high a big temperature change over a relatively small thickness change. So we call that a high thermal gradient. Um, big temperature change across a low, a, a short distance. And that's really what the lithosphere is all about. It's this thin insulating blanket or oven door that is maintaining a huge thermal gradient. It's, it's a barrier. The lithosphere is a barrier between a hot upper mantle in a cold surface. And this is really what's regulating heat flow from the interior to the surface. So heat flow itself um, is actually a really important term. And we're going to look at this more in class. It's essentially given by the thermal conductivity, or K, multiplied by the thermal gradient. And I skipped over this before, but we'll go back. The thermal gradient is given by the thickness of the lithosphere. Excuse me, that's the change in temperature of the lithosphere divided by the thickness. So delta T, or delta temperature, divided by delta Z, or delta thickness. So that's 1,300 Celsius divided by 200 kilometers gives us 6.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So that is the thermal gradient. Now, heat flow is given by the conductivity multiplied by that thermal gradient. Okay, So how quickly can heat actually flow um, from the base of the lithosphere up to the surface? One important point here is that the temperature at the base of the lithosphere is essentially constant. So as a result, heat flow is controlled by plate thickness. right? So what I'm saying there is that this delta T is usually very close to 1,300 degrees. So when we think about what controls the thermal gradient, it's usually the denominator, the, the delta Z, or the thickness of the lithosphere. All right, and so here's a map of heat flow. This brings together all these concepts we've talked about. Right? This shows how quickly heat energy is escaping from that through that lithospheric blanket. And what do we see here? Right away, we see the mid-ocean ridges outlined in bright red. Heat is just gushing out of those mid-ocean ridges. Why? Because the lithosphere there has a thickness essentially of zero. Essentially, Earth's mantle is coming up and touching the surface at these mid-ocean ridges, resulting in a hugely high heat flow.
In contrast, if we look at some ancient continents, like let's say Africa, very thick, old continental lithosphere. Uh, so that delta Z is very thick. It's like 200 kilometers. So the heat flow ends up being very low and slow out of these thick continents. Essentially, the thick continents are really thick blankets, and the young oceanic lithosphere is a very thin blanket. So bringing that home with a couple real-world examples, um, Iceland, you may know, uh, sits right on a mid-ocean ridge here. The heat flow is incredibly high. Um, as a result, Iceland is the number one producer of geothermal energy in the world. They're able to actually harness those hot rocks very close to the surface to actually make geothermal energy. The, the whole country is powered by geothermal. And bringing it closer to home in the United States, the U.S. is an example of a continent that actually has an interesting variety of thermal gradients and thus of heat flows. So um, areas in blue, like the Sierra Nevada, have uh, very low thermal gradients, okay? So temperature doesn't change very much with depth. Areas in orange, like Battle Mountain, have very high thermal gradients, uh, where temperature increases uh, quite a lot with depth. So how do we explain those different thermal gradients and, and thus heat flows in the United States? Well, the Sierra Nevada mountain range is, has a very thick crustal root the lithosphere is essentially extra thick right there. And it's acting as a great insulator and uh, the thermal gradient is, is very low and heat flow is very low. Okay, basin and range is kind of one of these intermediate areas. This is an area where the lithosphere has been extended. And as the lithosphere has been pulled apart, it's essentially thinned and has created a, a higher thermal gradient and, and higher heat flow. Here at Battle Mountain or at Yellowstone in, in northwest Wyoming, the thermal gradient is extremely high. It's at a maximum because we actually have a plume of very hot magma actually rising up as a hot spot beneath Yellowstone. So there we've actually got an upwelling mantle plume that's coming right underneath the lithosphere and is actually driving that high heat flow. And finally, the rest of us off here in the eastern United States, we're pretty much living on old, thick, tectonically dead continental lithosphere. And so the heat flow out here is uh, particularly low as well. So in summary, um, Earth's interior is hot due to residual heating and ongoing radiogenic heating. And that heat is trying to escape, but the cooling is very slow because rock is a poor conductor of heat energy. So as a result, because Earth can't conduct its heat away, it's forced to cool by convection. And most of that convection is taking place in Earth's mantle, except for the overlying lithosphere, which is rigid and can't conduct, acts like a blanket and is forced to conduct heat away. Now, it's this cycle of mantle convection that's actually driving uh, plate tectonics. We're getting upwelling at spreading ridges and downwelling at subduction zones. And if you look at heat flow overall on Earth, it's essentially controlled by conduction through the lithosphere. Uh, convection is delivering heat right to the base of the lithosphere very effectively, and the heat flow is just a matter of how quickly that, that heat energy can conduct through that last rigid layer of lithosphere. And that depends on the thermal gradient, which essentially depends on the lithospheric thickness, which of course depends on tectonics. So here's a couple concept questions I'll leave you with. Hopefully you could answer these videos after having watched, answer these questions after having watched the video a second time. Have a great day.